residents appreciate it as well. Uh, as you may recall, the board approved a 6.6 million dollar investment in uh, four different workforce development programs uh, on June 30th of 2021. Uh, and I'll take you through each of those four programs today with a brief update on the Oakland 80 Career and Education Navigators, the Oakland County Business Resource Network Restart, Flexible Workforce Assistance, and Child Care Scholarships. These four programs are administered through Oakland County Workforce Development or the Oakland County Michigan Works Agencies. And we're really proud that these um, first four projects were um, the first of the county to make it through the entire Guidehouse eligibility assessment and approval process. So uh, we're, we're very proud of uh, making it through that process. So I'll start first with our um, career and educational navigators as part of the county's Oakland 80 pool. Um, the investment of the board was 2.874 million. Um, we are administering this program in partnership with Gasher Human Services, formerly known as, as JVS. Um, they have hired seven career and education navigators on our behalf who are deployed across Oakland County um, with a goal of meeting with any Oakland County resident who's in need of career and educational navigation. So whether that's an adult who um, maybe stopped out of, of college or a, a post-secondary program or a certificate program and didn't complete, someone who's considering a, a career change or someone who needs help navigating FAFSA and educational application processes, anyone can reach out to um, these navigators very easily um, by going to the oakgov.com slash Oakland 80 website or calling our 1-800 number. Um, and they're connected immediately to a career and education navigator. So very easy to use and easily accessible. The um, seven navigators, as well as the navigator manager, um, are just a dynamic, exciting, um, passionate group of, of leaders. Um, they represent their communities, they're embedded in their communities, and if you haven't had the chance to meet this group, um, I've, I've never worked with such a dynamic group of people so early on in their in their jobs and their career. Um, we've started developing a lot of marketing and outreach materials as well um, with the support of Good Marketing and a small contract that we have with them. And they've targeted both um, our residents across the county. So you'll see that flyer on the left side of the screen and on the right side of the screen. Um, you'll see we're already targeting it, targeting it to businesses as well as a way to help them reach their employees and develop the skill set of their employees across Oakland County. Um, so this is our first quarterly report. So we went retroactively um, to July 1st of 2021. So you'll see these are zeros because our navigators just started on July 13th of 2022. Um, so our next quarterly report will start to capture um, the data. We are on target for um, this project, but just since we launched this on July 13th, we've already engaged with 418 Oakland County residents and attended 32 community events um, to make sure that there's an awareness across um, the community about this great program uh, and, and great initiative. Um, the next one I'll cover is our Business Resource Network Restart. Um, and this was a little bit over $1 million of the total award. Uh, this is in partnership with the Oakland Livingston Human Services Agency, or OLSA. And the concept of this program is that we deploy um, success coaches out to companies um, to meet with workers, any worker um, who is facing challenges um, with keeping their employment. And this is a win-win for both business and the the employee. Um, we know that turnover is very costly for our businesses, particularly small businesses across Oakland County. So those success coaches are deployed out to companies one day a week um, for a couple of hours, and those employees can meet with them confidentially to discuss any issues. Um, we've come across um, employees whose children don't have beds. We've come across employees whose um, cars are broken down and they have no way to get to work. Um, we've encountered an individual who took out a payday loan at a 600% interest rate that they needed help getting out of. And so um, those are issues that people are comfortable talking to human resources about, but they are comfortable um, speaking with our success coaches. In addition, the businesses that are part of the Business Resource Network, they also meet together monthly to talk about common challenges and barriers and 
um, help develop solutions even across companies on how they could work together um, to address barriers for employees of their organizations. So we have some great resource materials um, that we get out to our businesses across Oakland County um, through our economic development team, through our community partners, and through our Michigan Works Business Services team. Um, in this short time, we've had 10 companies join the Business Resource Network, uh, and actually we've just added three more in the last week or two, so that will be reflected on our next report. And we've served 177 employees at those companies and removed 306 barriers. And again, it can be anything from you know, transportation challenges, um, you know, personal challenges, mental health challenges, um, the, the list is a, a wide variety. This is a list of the businesses um, that currently belong to the Business Resource Network. Um, so you'll see it's a diverse group of manufacturing, um, human service agencies, um, orthopedic organization, the towns and hotels. So it's a very diverse group. And this program is targeted at small businesses, which is defined as less than uh, 500 um, employees. The third um, area is the flexible workforce assistance. And this was $1.5 million. Um, this is administered through our six Oakland County Michigan Works offices. And this is funding that is used to help individuals who are transitioning into employment or enrolling in post-secondary education who need assistance overcoming those barriers to be successful in education or employment. And so you'll see a list there of everything that we've discussed a bit under the BRN, which was for existing employees. This is for those entering education or the workforce. Um, and a common challenge we're finding is um, transportation challenges, also those one-time work-related expenses. So someone that found a job but needs to buy work boots or tools and they don't have the funding to, um, to do that as they start a new job. A lot of challenges around car repairs and the cost of car repairs, auto insurance, and uh, educational materials, particularly for people that are enrolled in the new Michigan Reconnect program, which covers 100% of tuition for any Michigan resident 25 or older at the community college, uh, but there's no funding for books or supplies. And so we're able to use these dollars um, to to have Michigan Reconnect support the tuition and our team um, to support the books and supplies that they need to be successful. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, we're reaching out to our residents through some great marketing materials. We're targeting uh, individuals enrolled in Futures for Frontliners and Reconnect to see if they need um, that additional support so they can stay in school and be a successful completer here in Oakland County. Uh, again, in a short period of time, this really launched um, late last year, early this year. Um, we've already had 120 individuals take uh, advantage of this program, and I provided you with the, the breakdown so that you can see where some of the challenges are. Um, the highest demand is in housing and child care. Um, housing, oftentimes, uh, they're just maybe one month behind on uh, rent for their apartment or their home, and we're able to assist with that. We do try to find other resources first, so we partner with OLSA or our um, community home, uh, I must call it community home improvement, no, neighborhood housing. housing uh, division here at the county. Uh, and The child care scholarship program. And this was a $1.2 million award. Um, it's administered through our six Oakland County Michigan Works locations. So these are $1,200 scholarships to 1,000 families across Oakland County. Um, we're targeting those individuals that need these resources to maintain employment, enter employment, maintain education or enroll in education. Uh, we do issue payment directly to the licensed child care facility um, to ensure that um, if the payment is made to the individual, it could impact their unemployment benefits, it could impact cash assistance or food assistance benefits. And we wanted to ensure that individuals were using licensed child care facilities. So we've done a lot of outreach to child care centers, community partners, and school districts um, to um, take advantage of uh, um, this program. Uh, and this is our, our outreach uh, flyer. 
uh, and we've already awarded 411 scholarships of the thousand scholarships that are available. We are respectfully requesting an extension on these funds. It was initially September 30, 2020, a one year, 2022, uh, that would run through September of 20. We're respectfully requesting that that be extended till twenty four thousand dollars Jennifer, are you still there? Looks like your camera. I think I lost my video. Yeah, it looks like your video. Yes, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Were you... Are still we, there, Jennifer? Are we I'm still here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Um, we're not sure if it's on our end or if it's on your end. Um, and I do want to affirm that we're still alive uh, on air. And also wanted to ask you if you were done with your report. Were you able to get to all your points? I, I know am, you and I'm, um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start off entertaining questions. I see Commissioner Markham in the queue, Commissioner uh, Wiper following, and then uh, Commissioner Cavell. That's right, I gotta push the button. Okay. Um, thank you. I, uh, I don't have a question. I just want to say that from personal experience, I have a family member who got that phone call to say because he had been working through Michigan Works to find a job and he got a good job. And about eight weeks later, maybe 10 weeks later, he got one of the phone calls that said, we will give you $1,000 toward tools. He works construction. So he got a whole new complement of drills and saws and all the things he needed to really do his job, and it was amazing. I just want to say how grateful my family member was to, to really have a, he's very proud of that tool set. He was able to go out and buy a good set of tools to do the job, and um, it's great. So one person at a time, you know, we're keeping people employed. I appreciate it, thank you very much. Mr. Wonderful, Wiper. thank you for sharing that. Commissioner Wiper. Well, thank you. So I, two things I, I noticed on the business resource, I saw Tribar, Tribar on there. Isn't Tribar the company in Wixom that had mm -hmm. the issues? They part yes. Of your, they're part of your network? Yes, they were, um, they've been a member of the network um, before that issue took place and we are aware of that and working with those employees, they're having some significant turnover challenges there. Um, and we did bring that to the attention of the administration that they are a business resource network company. Okay, and then the second, the second thing on the scholarships, I'm, I'm just a comment, I'm glad to see. How does, um, Sorry. How does it? How does it work with the? I'm glad to see you're paying the scholarships on the childcare right to the facility. So there's an application process by a family, and then they turn it over to childcare. Does the childcare help help process it to through 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 you to the family? I mean, what's the, what's the mechanics? I'm, I'm, yeah, the, I'm the, glad there's not abuse since it's going directly to the childcare facility. But yes, the family applies directly to us. Um, we do the eligibility assessment to ensure that they meet the uh, income requirements. So they have to be 300% of poverty or eligible for federal workforce programs. So we assess their eligibility. We also get confirmation that they are in fact uh, enrolled at a licensed child care facility and receive documentation of that um, directly from the licensed child care facility. And then we issue payment um, directly to that child care facility. So we handle the eligibility assessment, the review of the documentation and the payment to them directly to ensure um, that nothing fraudulent is occurring on either the child care provider side or the family side. Okay, and is it, is it seamless? I mean, is there, is there um, do they accommodate so there's no delay? You know, if, if somebody's going in for, well, we need child care, uh, but we don't have any money, we, and we need child care so we can work. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a, the it's, child, a pretty, it's a pretty seamless, 
it's a pretty seamless process. Um, you know, our Michigan Works agencies are accustomed to this type of work. Um, you know, we currently operate about 57 different federal and state um, training programs and supportive services programs totaling about $25 million annually. So we have the infrastructure in place, the staffing in place, the model already in place. And I think that's what's made this so successful is we could you know, take this and just plug it into our existing structure and leverage um, the staff time and um, team that are already working in this space. Okay, I appreciate that because you know, somebody goes and applies hey, I need child care right now. And then the child care facility says, uh, well, you know, we need to be paid mm. and that it's going to take a month for the application. And meanwhile, the person's losing their job because they can't find care for their kids. But so it's not, I'm glad to hear it's, it's seamless or you've got the infrastructure in place. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Wiper. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Quill. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I had um, one, maybe two questions. Um, you had mentioned before when um, we've talked that, you know, other communities put a lot of their ARPA money towards workforce development and that we are maybe a laggard or maybe not, but either way, uh, you were saying, man, if I had more money, I'd do all sorts of good things with them. Is there anything here that we're missing or that your team would benefit from having more of? in order to help get people back into jobs? Well, thank you, Commissioner Cavalli. I appreciate that question. Um, we are working on a series of um, proposals um, working with uh, Deputy County Executive Sean Carlson and Chief Deputy County Executive uh, Hillary Chambers, and we've presented um, to their team a few other workforce development investments um, that includes children's savings accounts. I know that's something that you're personally passionate right. about, um, yeah. Commissioner. Um, we've also uh, shared information on a Advise Oakland program, which would deploy advisors into high schools across Oakland County. We know that that is a, a pain point for many of the school counselors across the districts um, that most of their time is spent addressing some of the other challenges and that there's not a lot of time for them for career and, and college advising. Um, we've been working on those. Um, we're also looking at an extension for the Oakland 80 scholarship program. Uh, we are currently funding that through funding through Michigan Works, a $2 million grant that we received. Um, and then looking at a, a mass core program in partnership with Oakland University and the city of Pontiac. So uh, we have, we've shared those. Um, I know that there's a, a high demand for the balance of funds that are that are left and available. And I know that it's a tough uh, position for this board and, and for the county executive to prioritize, you know, what are the, the most important investments. But um, we do have some other projects in the queue that we would be interested in, in leading and uh, administering if those funds are available. Okay, cool. Um, then I thank you for sharing that. Uh, I just had one other question, which is, um, and I don't know the context of this fully, but is the Pontiac Michigan Works Office something that you run? And if so, how's it going? Because I heard that there was turnover or something, or um, is it, are things are the needs being met there? Yes, so um, we do administer the Oakland County Michigan Works Office in Pontiac. It's one of our six centers. Our other centers are in Novi, Oak Park, Southfield, Troy, and Waterford. Um, Goodwill Industries of Greater Detroit, uh, they operate both our Pontiac office and our Novi office on our behalf. Um, we did have some staffing challenges there, much like many other businesses and organizations across Oakland County. Um, we, we had some turnover and as a result, we were short staffed there. We had four positions that were vacant. vacant. Um, so I immediately went out there and met with the team there as well as the Vice President of, of Goodwill Industries of Greater Detroit. And um, we sat down and developed a plan to fill those positions. Those positions have been filled um, and we've addressed that challenge and even looked at, um, you know, how do we increase the um, 
the speed of the services, the accuracy of the services, customer service, how can we streamline things? Um, it is a unique community um, and it's a community that we do have to rebuild some trust. Um, we, we had some, some challenges about 10 years ago uh, with that center, but we worked really hard to improve our services and Im improve um, the delivery of services there. So I'm, I'm really proud of the progress that that team has made. Um, and we, we continue to work on that. I do think that it's improving, but I will acknowledge we did have some staffing challenges there. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that update and your candor, and I think you're doing great, and all this stuff looks awesome, and I hope you get all your ARPA requests. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Spiz? Thank you, Madam Chair. Jennifer, thank you for the information and the report. A lot of great information. I'm looking forward for the next report so we can hopefully see continued growth in all those programs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on the thank spot you. a little bit and leading off what Charlie asked. Can you give us a, a brief intro to the Going Pro that was just put out there. I know there's some programs coming out for the businesses to call into, but I'm hoping you can give us a little synopsis here. Sure. Um, so we we love the Going Pro Talent Fund, so I'm happy to uh, share Commissioner Spitz. Uh, the Going Pro Talent Fund is a statewide funding program. Uh, this year it is funded at $55 million. Uh, and this fund allows businesses to apply for funding to um, train their existing employees, their new hires, or create uh, new registered apprenticeships. Companies can apply through our six Oakland County, Michigan Works locations. We are hosting information sessions starting, I think today or tomorrow is our first one. Uh, we will host those through most of the month of September and, and possibly into October. Um, companies apply through Michigan Works. There is an application period. Uh, at this point, we believe the state will open up the application period somewhere between November 8th and November 15th. Um, and that application period will be open for four weeks where businesses can apply. It is a competitive grant application. Uh, and the state actually selects um, the awards and scores the the application and determines the amount of the award. So that's not a local decision that's made. Uh, the businesses in Oakland County, uh, last year we had 120 companies uh, that received awards totaling 3.4 million. Uh, we trained over 1,200 of their employees, um, created 77 new apprenticeships, and I think trained over 2,700 new workers. So it's a really impactful program. It's beneficial to businesses because it's able to offset their training costs, um, to advance their workforce, to retain their workforce, to create registered apprenticeships. But it's also a value for uh, employees and Oakland County residents because they do have to receive an industry recognized credential. So this isn't soft skills training, it's not, you know, leadership or communication training. This is IT certifications or HVAC certifications. Um, these are, are skills and credentials that they will be able to carry um, throughout their career. So I know I, I shared the flyer with, with Connie to uh, share with all of you. And so if you have businesses um, within your, your districts that you would be willing to share that with and um, tell them about the information sessions we're hosting, we would love to have them. and hope that they will um, consider learning more about it and applying for the program. Great, thank you. Commissioners, any further questions for this report from communications? All right, well, thank you, Jennifer, for all your work. And uh, I've got, your contact information was in the at the end of that PDF, so I've got some questions, but I wanna be mindful of time, and they're not germane to what we're discussing. So thank you, though. And thank you, have everyone. A great week. And I apologize for the technical issues. It happens. That takes us into our regular agenda. Uh, we need a motion to uh, go into the other action of approving of an extension of the 2022 Invasive Spongy Gypsy Moth program to 2023. Do I have a motion? I move it. Commissioner Smith moves, Commissioner Cavell supports, 
and I believe you're going to give us some more information. Yeah, just a brief update. We came in with a report, I believe it was last meeting. Oh. Um, but what we're looking for here is we allocated uh, 250000 for the initial part of this program. We did not use that all this year, so we're looking to carry over those funds, which is roughly $156,000 into the next year program. Um, and the next year's program we're hoping to expand slightly. Originally we only paid for the mitigation of the moth, but this year we're gonna also pay for the mapping, you know, the survey. They have to go through a surveying process to see where they may need to get mitigation spraying or other types in place. So we just wanna carry that over into the next fiscal year so we can use those monies for another program next year. Any discussion, commissioners? Mr. Cavell. So, um, when will the program end or because this is invasive species will it just need to kind of keep being we very good question Thanks. and i don't think we have a great answer <laughs> for it unfortunately okay. um, we're hoping after the next year program we'll have to, we'll definitely have to reevaluate um, but we're hoping to get all the communities up and moving that they can actually start taking this process on themselves and okay. Either we'll have to, as a county, move that into a depart department, it won't be through the board commissioners anymore, or it'll be up to the communities themselves to take care of it. So this will be the last? This is expected okay. to be the last. Gotcha. From okay. the board of commissioners special yeah. projects fund. Understood. Mr. Lockhart, did you want to jump in? I saw your camera go live, or you're just? Oh, you actually have uh, just a little tidbit on this, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, one of our drains of the Clinton River Pontiac Water, or Pontiac, Clinton River Water Resource Facility in Pontiac Recently, uh, the egg department came out and discovered uh, the spotted lanternfly, which is another invasive species, and they accumulated on a tree of heaven, which we had a, a few of them out there. And we worked with FMNO to eradicate them because the state couldn't get on them for like two months. By then, they would have changed and moved on, essentially. And um, I think those are detrimental to food crops, uh, trees, fruit trees. If I believe right, like you know, cherries, apples, peaches, those kind of things. So, our office worked with facilities to get on them right away. And, and originally, the plan was to get rid of the tree of heaven, but then they realized that because the, the moth or, or butterfly, whatever it is, spotted lanternfly is attracted to it, they're keeping them there. So, then they would congregate there, then they can eradicate them. So, there's more than just the moth we're dealing with, there's a, a bunch of others. So, sure to, be, to be yet determined. <laughs> That was a recent development, though, just happened about three weeks ago. Wow. It's a pretty little butterfly, but they are. Bad. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, they don't look like monarchs, monarchs, do they? They're pink and black and oh. spotted. They're really pretty. Yeah, and they got big red yeah. sections of red on Just well, a little tidbit there. Thank you for uh, letting well, me speak here. I appreciate that um, extra level of info there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I will just make sure no one else has any discussion points on this, and we can... Call for, call for the vote or prompt the vote. Okay. Wonderful. You have five yeas, zero nays. Terrific motion carried. I'll entertain a motion to. Uh, we need a motion to open. The uh, item 8B, full faith and credit pledge to issue bonds for improvements to the Evergreen Farmington Sanitary Drain Drain Drainage System. Uh, move move by it. move by Commissioner Cor I'll it. Quarles is on our minds today. Apparently, uh, Commissioner Markham and Commissioner Wiper support it. We have speaking for this report, Mr. Lockhart, and you can introduce yeah. your team if you've got others on the call. Yeah, with me should have uh, Laura Bassett from Dickens Wright, our bond council, and also Stephen Burke from MFCI is our financial advisor consultant that's going to take care of placing placing the bonds. And uh, before you today is a full faith and credit resolution for $135 million for a series of projects on the Evergreen Farmington system. The system has had a consent order with the state of Michigan, along with a lot of our member communities also had their own consent orders, and it was decided over a decade ago that the communities would <clears throat> jump in with us and collectively solve this problem as a whole that, get, that would ultimately get rid of our consent order with the state as well as their own. And so through a series of projects over years where we would do projects to see how it performed a certain rain event, then model it and go back and do it. I think this is a culmination and final series of projects called the corrective action plan you see in the estimate called the CAP 
that uh, Eagle <coughs> has agreed to will hopefully resolve it and we're gonna do the project projects and then you know meter and model it and, and ensure that it's gonna take care of the issue. And what they look at at the state is a 10 year, one hour non-growing rain event along with a 25 year, 24 hour growing rain event. And um, look at the flow and see off of what the system was built for, you know, how, how much flow do we have? And we think we had, we had actually more than what was, uh, you know, the weather capacity was over years. I'm sure climate control has an issue, uh, not climate control, but you know, the changing climate has a effect on that. And we had to deal with other 57 CFS and there was alternatives to build a tank but the tank, you know, of that size was big and costly and more money than what this project and series of projects are, plus the tank would only fill up in a certain rain event. So through a tri-party agreement and a creative thinking with uh, Commissioner Nash's office, uh, really SWAT authority, so Detroit, the blessing of Eagle, we come up with a, a compromise to actually purchase capacity from LIWA. They don't actually, don't actually have the capacity to sell, but um, they're gonna work with Detroit to do separation of stormwater on the Santa Cruz sewer south of Eight Mile Road and free up that capacity of 57 CFS. So we'll have a outlet that's bigger that can take this flow and save us from building the tank. So with, you know, before you today, you see you see the projects, they're serious on a big map and a list on the estimate. And we did apply for SRF financing on this, which we were just notified a few weeks ago that we're in the mix of getting that. So we're going through the application process, Steve Burke and our consultants, are working on that with us. And we have a securing interest rate of 1.875% and roughly 10% principal forgiveness on this project. You know, that I'll ask any questions anybody has and that of our team. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I don't see any on the in my queue. Oh, Mr. Wiper, then Mr. Mr. Cavell. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's okay. It, it, I should have gone with Spitz first the last time, and I didn't notice he had his hand up. <laughs> um, this is a big deal, $131 million bond issue. I, I know you'll do it in a series, so it's effective. But this has been, com this has been coming after 10 years, right? I mean, and consent decrees and and... I mean, yes. this, this, uh, this is not something done lightly. I mean, this. No, nope. and and we have quarterly meetings with our Irving and Farmington uh, system representatives. You see, you know, Auburn Hills, Beverly Hills, Bingham Farms, you know, the whole list is in front of you and their apportionment. So every quarter we have meetings with them to tell them what we're do, you know, what we're going to do on it, what the plan is, the meetings with Eagle, and uh, they've been on board with it for for decades of getting get to this point. And just, just to put in perspective, the average user in our system is gonna see a $5 a month increase uh, over the bond life for this these projects. Okay, well, thank you. You said $5 a month increase. On their sewer bill. On their yep. sewer bill. That's not trivial. And that's just putting it roughly, because we don't, that's, you know, we don't deal with what the communities do you know, we apportion the communities and the communities take that apportionment, apportion cost and put it in their rates. So they may have more on their side or less. They may have money in reserves to buffer this. Some may pre, some people actually may prepay cash. Some communities decide to prepay not being a loan. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, they'll only be adjusted down for those who prepay and don't want to be in the financing. So the $5 is just an average because we don't know what they do on the, the local side of that. But that's just big picture look at what, what the impact is. Thank you. Mr. Cavell? So uh, the, to that question, the, or the, to that point, the $5 a month, is that split between the whole, um, is that just for the Evergreen Farmington Sanitary Drain yes, District? Just, or is it? A, okay. the, yeah. There's, there's 127,000 households in that district. So we just take like the annual debt service and divide it by that. Cause like I said, we don't know what the local communities do with the, the apportioning costs sure. back to them. So that's just a rough average, like a big picture look. And so, the, got you. But so, okay, the, the district, all of these communities are in the WRC district? Yep, they're in Farmington, Sanders Sewer Drain District. Okay, so then, yep. um, but they're- each, each drain district is a separate legal corporate public corporation. 
Oh, okay. And how many Dream separate, Districts do separate. we have? We have a lot. Uh, we have <laughs> probably hundreds of them. We oh. live in summer sewers, one's a wastewater plant, Pontiac, summer county drains, or I mean, they're all county drains under the state of Michigan drain code, but summer storm drains, open ditch and close. The Clinton River is actually, mm. I think, three different ones in Pontiac, where it's, uh, it's called the PCR, I think one, two, and three. And Mike McBann and Jeff Wilson are after me, and they could probably answer more of those okay. <laughs> questions, how many. But it's a unique form of government that Michigan has through the, through the drain code. So. The drain board, which is you know, Commissioner Dash, Markham, and uh, Commissioner Woodward, make up the three-person drain board that oversee all these public corporations. So every mm-hmm. month we have meetings where we have 10 or 15 of them, open business and closed business and pay bills. And so once this, uh, we get this full faith and credit approved, uh, you know, from your committee and finance board of commissioners, once that goes through, then the drain board will be the ones actually issuing that bond. So Lord Bassford Dickinson can expand on that if I misspoke here. Okay. Cool. You know, thank you for that education. And you said the interest rate's 1.875 percent, yeah, or something like that. And, okay. And uh, Steve, Steve Berg, MSCI, he always has his pulse on current bond issues. And I think that if we went you know, outside of that program, we'd probably look at about three and a half. Is that right, Steve? In today's world. Yes. And there's there is one advantage, you know, and we have to go through, uh, you know, a bunch of extra hoops and a project plan, and it's some costly on the front end. There's some uh, issuance costs that we save not going to the public market but there's there's one advantage that's kind of big uh, when you talk about this kind of money is the bond principal doesn't have to be paid i believe until six months after the projects are done and the loan is closed out so the, we're probably looking at like three years worth the worth of project because the eight mile pump station project itself is around 50 million on the estimate and that's like major equipment that has to be custom ordered and purchased. So that's like a three year project. By the time you design it, by the time you finish it and start it, it takes a little bit longer because our existing station has to keep running. So you have to do these pumps like one at a time. Mm-hmm. You just can't take it out of commission and build a new one. There's not a real estate to build a new one next to it. So even though we'll be getting draws in this loan, we pay um, interest, we pay to make the interest, the interest payment along the way, but the principal payment doesn't start until the project's done. So there is time for communities to, uh, you know, adapt for what what's coming if they haven't already. Okay. And we and we have had some meetings at Beverly Hills because uh, the project cost did go up, and so uh, to explain to their city council or their village council, you know, why the cost is up and why it's higher because of the, uh, you know, the new. That's the new construction economy that we're in. Everything is kind of crazy and don't know where the, the bids are going to come in at. So those that had have issues with the increased costs, we have met with them and they're they're on board. Okay, thank you. And just for the commission, I just want to mention the uh, first, whereas on the second page, just in light of uh, our conversations about the facilities. Yes. Just just the, yeah, but that's important to know those numbers. Our, you know, county debt load and what we're able to, like, borrow. Thanks. Agreed. You're welcome. All right. I don't see any hands raised. I do want to just indicate that, I mean, I've learned some stuff today as well. Uh, when we talk about this drainage district, in particular, the one we're here talking about now, is is the eight-mile station there because, like, water moves southward um just the rash just the structural rationale i'm, I'm just curious you know we're talking kigo all the way down to eight mile and yeah. then go ahead well and this may yes that's true because mainly as far as topography goes the way um to build civil infrastructure is to follow the rivers essentially so if you're looking at the water sense how the rivers flow to mainly like the rouge and then down to detroit which is what the treatment plan is. And then other system like Clinton, Oakland actually goes over to um, the Clinton River, which goes to Lake St. Clair, then eventually down through through that way. So in the 50s, I believe, Oakland County, uh, along with our office, and there was public works back then, it was part of county, the county executive branch, I believe, before it got merged to the drain commissioner's office, uh, built the big interceptors that all the towns could uh, you know, dump into. And then with sewers, you know, density goes up and then tax base goes up and all that kind of thing. So those are have septic fields. If your ground doesn't perk and lots are big and some actually can't perk. So with the sewers, we have, you know, what we've come to love today is where 
Oakland County has de developed. And it was always keeps pollution out of the lakes and streams and keeps the environment clean. But uh, normally it follows the rivers because if you follow the natural topography, you avoid building a bunch of pump stations. And over like in Macomb County, their government didn't back in the day didn't build to see this expansion or do the, the I don't say correct, but not that level of planning, urban planning and development. And Detroit DWSD has built their big interceptors. And then our office back about 10 years ago, 2010, I believe, nine, Mike McMahon was involved in that. It was on next. Um, with Commissioner Morocco and McCullough took over that part of it because Oakland County, Macomb, being 100% of that interceptor cost from Detroit. And then that's what we see. On occasion, you'll see OMID come up here for full pay and then credit. That's the OMID system. We actually took that interceptor over. So it was a DWSD asset became now uh, uh intercounty drain board asset was and we have an intercounty drain board the state of michigan chairs the board of the ag department if you have multiple counties that's in the drain code separate legal corporation like the chapter 20s 21s the state of michigan chairs the uh the board and the two commissioners jim nash and candace miller are the members okay and but that's a good question though but it does flow from down to you know all the way from here down to eight mile road and follows the rivers essentially to the wastewater treatment plan yeah in detroit well, in another life, I was all about topography. So, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so then and that's my the biggest that's the biggest wastewater plant in the entire world on one footprint. Wait, one more time. <laughs> the city of Detroit wastewater plant, and that was Gleewa's, you know, under the Gleewa lease. That's the largest wastewater plant in the world, I believe, at one footprint on oh. one in one footprint. There's ones that are bigger that are divvied up like multiple sites, but that takes the most amount of people. I think it's the biggest plant in the world, a one footprint of one site. Fascinating. Where all, where all goes to. I, I could listen to you all day, Lockhart. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I do have any more of your time. I could talk all day about it. Too. I see. I do have one, um, one um, piece that I must say is that number five on the exhibit A does bring me a little palpitation. <laughs> When I when I see the words multi million multi million gallon sewage retention tank uh, in my neck of the woods, so uh, I need all the insurances in the world. If if Commissioner Miller was here, I'd be like, uh, engineers, I need you all to mount up and make sure that this is super safe because that is that is just beyond frightening to me. I mean, we've got the Rouge tributaries not too far from there. Uh, can I can I have some assurances for the voters and taxpayers in uh, my locale that we're not gonna we're not gonna regret this in 30 years? Well, we're doing this conveyance project with this purchase capacity in lieu of the tank, actually. In so lieu the of. tank was the first was the first alternative we looked at, and through this agreement with Gle with Gliwa and uh, City Detroit and Eagle, we're doing this. We're buying capacity instead of building the tank. Okay. That makes me feel much more. <laughs> me too. <laughs> environmentally sound. Okay. I, I, I think that's all I have. I um, think that was all we had, commissioners. So let's prompt the vote. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Sid and team, for being here. And. Uh, Maybe we'll see you again here shortly. I'm not sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that takes us into item C of our regular agenda. I'll take a motion to open report Water Resources Commissioner Resolution Assessments for Chapter 4 Drains. I'll move. Commissioner Markham and Commissioner Spiz support it. Uh, is it Mr. Wilson? Or. Actually, um, I'll start off and then I'm going to probably hand it over to Jeff. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike McMahon. I'm a chief engineer over at the Water Resources Commissioner's Office, and I oversee the maintenance unit that, that oversees uh, all the drains and lakes within Oakland County, um, all, the, all the county drains anyways. And we come annually with these uh, requests for approval on our assessments. Um, chapter 4 refers to the Michigan Drain Code, which is the legislation uh, that was that dictates how how drains are established and maintained and so this year we're, we're bringing um, 
it looks like 82 different assessments. What we do every year is we look at all of our, our drains and somebody had asked the question, how many county drains there are in total? We're somewhere between 350 and 375. And they're, they're established under different chapters of the drain code, as you see here, we have chapter four drains, which typically are older, more rural drains, at least they were when they were established that serve farmlands. Many of those areas have become more developed. And so now there are, um, you know, some more impervious area, but those drains are assessed individually to the property owners within the district. And uh, as well, there are some uh, at large assessments to the CBTs and there's assessments to the county on behalf of the, the roads. So we look at each district and each district is broken up, you know, and, and looked at as far as who benefits and that's how the uh, the allocation of cost is done. But again, we're bringing 82 different assessments to you today for approval, um, which in aggregate total $742,000. Um, those of you who have been on the board in the past are, are probably familiar with the process. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you wanna add anything um, in regard to work that's ongoing, or I think you had a couple of highlights you wanted to make. Yeah, sure. And uh, boy, we're lucky we had Sid here with the primer on this because a lot of times we start from scratch explaining the drainage districts. But as Mike said, these are they're mostly old agricultural drains. They still exist and provide drainage to um, you know largely residential communities now. And uh, under the drain code, these assessments are capped. So there's uh, a limit to how much maintenance that we can do each year and maintenance on these really consists of uh, um, inspection and repair of manholes for enclosed systems inspections and repair of pipes so um, digging up and replacing damaged pipes or collapsed pipes and then uh, in, when it comes to open channels uh, inspection of open channels removing of sediment removal of downed trees and um, there's about uh, 200 open channel miles, there's about 450 uh, enclosed pipe miles uh, for all the drains and drainage districts throughout the county. So there's a, a good number of assets here that, uh, that we're talking about. And um, the limits, the maintenance limits on these drains, they depend on the total length of the drain. So it's $5,000 per mile of drain. So the longer the drain is, the higher your maintenance cap is. So that's why you see a lot of these numbers are rounded to essentially $5,000 or $2,500 that has to do with uh, drain code limits. Now you kind of exceed that amount in the event of an emergency. I wanna highlight uh, the Patterson Holly drain. We had a pretty substantial emergency. There was a uh, blockage in a pipe that um, upon investigation, we determined the blockage was too hard to uh, remove from jetting. So jetting is a technique where you um, send pressurized water into an existing pipe and you free a blockage of it. Well, the pipe is so old, it couldn't take jetting, it would fall apart. So a, a total replacement was needed for um, about 200 feet of pipe. And this included rerouting some of the pipe because it was uh, through a, a difficult condition. So um, there was an emergency repair there and uh, you'll see the assessment on that is $108,000. Now, all of these assessment districts, uh, not only do they vary um, in size, but they certainly vary in parcel count. Some of these assessment districts are as small as 15 parcels. Uh, the largest one's about 7,500 parcels. In this case, the Patterson Holly drain um, has about uh, 2,800 parcels, I believe. So the average assessment for this emergency repair is, um, is roughly $60. I believe is the, the median on the parcels out there. So it certainly um, is a large increase. Oh no, excuse me, this one is, just checking my notes, uh, this one's $27 for the median assessment. So um, this is a larger district, it's a larger drain, it can absorb it a little bit better. Um, but you know, some of these districts, they're a lot smaller, so um, comparable emergency would hit them a lot harder. And in the event that something like that happens on a small district, We've actually come before the board and um, asked for a five-year loan out of um, a different program that the county offers to allow residents to pay that back over a longer period of time. That doesn't apply this year, but occasionally that comes up. 
But uh, that's about all I wanted to highlight in terms of this year's assessments. Everything else is, is pretty ordinary, um, consists of the maintenance that we already outlined. And so I'll open that up to any questions at this point from the board. Thank you, I appreciate that. And Mr. McMahon, I overlooked your name right there. So uh, thank you for leading us off. Any commissioner questions uh, from the body? Doesn't look like it. I think Mr. Cavell, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, who got the highest assessment like per household and what is that amount? Um, I'd have to check my notes on that. So in general, what we're when we're going through these, we are checking um, those types of stats. And um, the largest per parcel amount in terms of the average would be uh, somewhere around eighty dollars per parcel. So in general, these are um, these are kept below a hundred dollars per parcel from you know what we. What we can see in our system, these, these drainage districts are all unique, they're all different sizes, and that's all tracked uh, in our drain apportionment program that has a GIS element to it. So uh, we're able to see these, see the roles, and um, I, I'm just going off of memory here that the $80 was about the largest one. I couldn't tell you which district that was, though. That's okay. Um, so is that an $80 additional assessment based on, uh, in addition to last year's? costs that they also were no no usually these are um because they're ongoing you, if you take a look at um let's see the report operate maintenance and operation um within the packet you'll see the previous assessment on these drains so referring to when it was last assessed most of them um, are assessed every year mm -hmm. and so a lot of times th those um those assessments are something that they see pretty regularly. Now the drain code limits what we can keep in the account and what we can spend on maintenance in a single year. So a lot of times there's a kind of a spreading element to some of this where um, we're assessing for less than what we actually did in maintenance. In other years we're assessing for, um, you know, potentially uh, something where there was no actual maintenance done and that's um, to try to keep it consistent so that we're not surprising people with assessments on these. And um, you know, usually people will see something every year on their assessments, and, and occasionally it jumps up. Um, but you know, in like in the case of the emergency here, where there's a surprise, they're actually going to get letters stating what happened and what the dollar amount's going to be, so that we uh, lessen the surprise. Now that emergency happened um, over the summer here, so we're actually preparing the letters now, and so they'll be sent out pretty shortly here. Um, before they actually receive the tax bill. Okay. Um, so that so all the things, all the communities on the spreadsheet that say 2021 got an assessment last year, say it was $60. This year it might be $80, but they're used to paying something because they get assessments every year. And so the range doesn't typically go up too high, like you said, based on the $100 limit. That, that's correct. So it's the, okay. the $5,000 per mile of drain. So it's not necessarily, the drain code limit is not based on um, how much you're hitting an individual parcel for. That's something that we uh, keep track of internally. We're not required to, but it's kind of an additional courtesy. We want to make sure that we're not overburdening anybody. And uh, for the most part, we're not. It's the situations where you have the emergency repair where somebody could get a, a large increase. So for example, I'll go back to that Patterson Holly. It's $108,000 this year. Normally it would be assessed for $25,000. That's where the letters come in. And that's actually required under the Michigan Drain Code that um, when you exceed that maintenance limit of $5,000 per mile, that you send a letter. And so in this case, they, they are gonna be notified that the emergency came up, we had to do something, we had to fix it. There was flooding out there um, there were actually uh, reports of some uh, sheds that were kind of down near this uh, lowland that it actually flooded, and that's what really prompted the calls on this for us to find it. So um, there was definitely damages. It had to be done, and uh, we, we took care of it. But on the flip of that, the assessment district does have to pay for it, and so we're required under the drain code to notify them. And it's just good practice, you know, to make sure that people are aware that this bill is coming. And um, it, it's not quite hit the point where we thought 
that we need to uh, go to the county board to get the short-term loan to allow the residents to pay it off because um, in our determination, it's still kind of below that um, that hundred dollars per parcel where we start looking at that option. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'll just add too that each year we look at every individual drainage district. We look at what work has been done. We look at what the existing fund balance is, what we expect the future work will be in the coming year. And so, and there also is a cap on the amount that we can keep in the account. So if we're nearing that cap, we don't assess over that. So uh, the assessments are gonna vary from year to year and the maintenance needs on any given drain is gonna vary from year to year. So yeah, so there's not, um, you know, there's not an exact amount that we assess every year, but like Jeff said, we generally try to keep it in that range um, and, and try to keep something on the roll so that they don't forget that they get assessed for that drain that keeps them kind of, um, you know, in, in the loop and knowing that to expect that. And those uh, assessments end up showing up on their winter tax bill. Thank you. Thank you. All right, looks like we're ready to prompt the vote. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, why not go right on into item five, which we have the same presenters. Uh, take a motion to open water resources commissioner assessments for chapter 18 drains. Uh, moved by Mr. Spiz, support supported it. by Mr. Wipert. Mr. McMahon, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So the only difference between the chapter 18 and the chapter four drains are the um, fact that they're normally established by a developer and we only have them in two communities where their uh, their ordinances dictate that and that is Oakland Township and West Bloomfield Township otherwise they're assessed to individual property owners in the same way that the chapter 4 drains are um, and again this year we're bringing 87 different uh, assessments for, for various districts uh, and as Jeff said in your packet there is a breakdown given in a couple of different ways per uh, drain, per community, um, so, so you can kind of see what, what's being assessed. Uh, this year, the chapter 18 assessments in aggregate total about $305,000. Uh, Chuck, do you have anything you wanna add again as far as highlights on what we've been doing in those drains? Yeah, just to explain the, the slight differences structurally between this and the chapter four, the chapter fours were, um, they were established in the distant past, mostly for agricultural purposes. These were established as uh, essentially subdivision drains. So when they came through and they developed the land, they created a, a network of drain pipes uh, out in the road and, and some in the rear yard to um, provide more of a modern um, level of service and, and type of drainage for uh, the roads and the, the rear yards and um, different portions of the subdivision. And uh, they usually don't consist of open channels, but they do have uh, sediment basins and detention basins that provide flood control. So that's um, typically a feature on these that you don't see as much on the chapter fours. So we do a lot of maintenance on uh, pipes on manholes and then on sediment basins and detention basins. And there's a couple of um, increases here. Maple Creek, uh, Kings Ridge, Kirklands, and uh, Westwind Lake where we had some emergency repairs. Uh, but these emergency repairs were, were much smaller than what we saw on the Chapter 4 Patterson Holly. So these are um, increases to the ordinary maintenance assessments. But um, for the most part, within uh, what the Michigan Drain Code allows. In fact, I believe these are entirely within what the Michigan Drain Code allows, so they won't actually receive mailings on these ones. Uh, there's somewhat of a uh, you know up and down in terms of what they get assessed uh, year to year, but that's that's ordinary within these Chapter 18 drains because. Um, there's just some years where, where things are falling apart and more maintenance is needed as revealed by inspection or um, some sort of uh, resident complaint that reveals that there's a problem. Uh, but 
you know, none of these are overburdening the residents, so there's no need for any kind of long-term loan or anything like that. If, if there was something larger, as we, we pointed out with the Chapter 4s, then uh, we may come to the Board of Commissioners asking for a short-term loan to help the residents out. Uh, that doesn't exist this year. All of these repairs we were able to take care of and assess under uh, norm, ordinary uh, maintenance and assessment conditions. So with that, are there any questions from the board on the Chapter 18? I see no questions uh, at this time, so we'll go ahead and prompt the vote. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to regular agenda item letter E. <laughs> and uh, I'll take a motion, open report water resources commissioner resolution assessments for lake level maintenance. Mr. Spiz and Ms. Ms. Markham, I saw your hand, uh, support it. Gentlemen, uh, we'll entertain your report okay so actually this is not a report again this is a series of uh, lake level assessments for our lake level control districts uh, which are operated under uh, legislation inland lakes uh, act and we have 29 districts we have more control structures in that each district again serves a given area and sometimes we have multiple control structures and we might also have augmentation wells that supplement the, the water level in the lake. Um, again, we look at these and bring these annually to the, to the board. Uh, the legislation uh, dictates that if the uh, assessment exceeds 10,000, which in this case, 24 of the 29 do, that we are obligated to bring those. We always bring all of them so that the commissioners are aware of the assessments that are occurring within their district. Um, for which lakes and for how much. Um, Ryan Volichik is, is with us uh, this morning. Ryan is the engineer who oversees directly the, the lake level control structure program. Um, we have uh, maintenance crews that send lake level technicians out to these on a, at least a once a week basis. They go out there, they make adjustments, they read the level of the lake and compare it to the legally established level, make adjustments to the um, to the control structure to or, or turn on or off augmentation wells to try to maintain that legal level. They clean up debris, clean up the site, you know, keep things under maintenance and and do other minor maintenance work. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you want to add any anything to that. Yeah, I'll just uh, point out a couple of the assessments that had some pretty major changes from last year. Um, we did have a fairly large change in Union Lake um, that was actually completely rebuilt, uh, no cost to the district with the exception of inspection by the Road Commission. Um, so they did see a doubling in their amount. It went from $14 to 27, so it wasn't anything major, but uh, it is a pretty big change. Um, and then a lot of our larger ones were updating our emergency management plans. Um, so some of the larger assessments you see are going toward essentially that engineering where we're um, breaking the dam in a model and seeing what uh, what properties are going to be flooded so we can uh, work with Oakland County Emergency Management to, to update that plan and bring it into today's day as opposed to a hand-drawn map from the 90s. Uh, we also this year have our triennial dam inspection scheduled where we go out, we send one of our engineers out to inspect the dam. They prepare a, a full report and submit that to the Eagle. Um, uh, well, is it Eagle or is it a different department, Brian? Uh, Eagle Dam Safety. So yes, it is Eagle, but oh, the dam, dam safety. safety unit. Yeah. yeah. With and, an and so they, they review those and, and if they have any comments, they get back to us. But we do that every three years. And uh, as part of the high hazard or the significant hazard dams, like Ryan said, we also have a emergency action plan that's attached to that report. So if there's any questions about any of, of the individual assessments, uh, we're happy to, to answer those questions. Thank you very much. Commissioners, I don't see any um, indications of questions or comments, so we'll go ahead and prompt the vote. Mm -hmm. Five 
zero nays. Thank you, motion carried uh, unanimously. That, thank you, gentlemen. That takes us to item number eight, which is, uh, well, I'll entertain a motion to open facilities maintenance and operations resolution, building management system replacement project, sixth phase. Mr. Wiper move moves, Mr. Spiz supports, uh, Mr. Murphy, the floor is yours. Morning, commissioners. Uh, Joe Murphy here, manager of facilities maintenance and operations. I have Steve Foster, he's the senior project manager, and Sean Hunt, who will be available for some of the other uh, resolutions we'll discuss in a few minutes. Uh, before you is a uh, part of our approved CIP for 2002. Uh, the re resolution is to replace our uh, billing management system. Um, I, every year I come before the group here to move into the next phase. Uh, this is uh, fixing critical uh, equipment that controls our heating, ventilation, cooling, dampers, lights, and uh, the total project uh, is uh, 600,000, 520,000 of the materials and installation of uh, $70,000 in engineering service of 10. Um, or the contingency is 10. So at this point, I can open up for questions. <laughs> uh, I see Mr. Spiz and then Mr. Whitebird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since this is the sixth phase, how many more <laughs> do you expect? I, I believe we're at least, uh, we've got uh, another portion of the courthouse to do. The uh, probably two phases of the jail is our next biggest building to do, and that will get us pretty close to 90% of the uh, facilities on campus. And then we're gonna have to reassess of, you know, how our campus is gonna look if we, you know, do things with the work from home plans and if some of those buildings may not need to be done. So I would say at least uh, three or four phases. Thank you. All set, Mr. Spiz, Mr. Wiper. And just, that's the lowest contingency, 2%. That's a pretty good one because it's, you, you got a pretty good idea what the costs are in this within, and it's, it's uh, engineering and software and things like that. So there won't, very there won't be, any, won't be any overruns. Very, correct. Anything else from you, Mr. Wiper? No, no, thanks. All right. Uh, the board is clear on, or I should say my speaker's list is cleared. And I guess we can prompt the vote. Thank you. That motion carried unanimously. Thank you again. Uh, we need a motion to, uh, we need a motion for the facilities management, facilities maintenance and operations fire alarm system upgrade project. Mr. Spiz moved, Mr. Cavell supported. Mr. Murphy, floor is yours. Okay, this is a, another uh, approved uh, 2022 CIP project. This is for fire alarm system upgrades. This will replace uh, five fire, fire alarm panels, um, Children's Village C, Children's Village D, Children's Village G, uh, Children's Village School, and the Annex. Um, total project uh, of $197,545, and I would happily answer any questions that you may have at this time. Any questions from members? <laughs> Go for it. Thanks, Joe. Were you able to look into where this one fell with all the other children village projects we worked on? So I know it's recent yeah, approved. Yes. Yes, yes, Commissioner. I did have a discussion with uh, Jason Warner. Uh, he's the manager of facilities planning and engineering. And the life safety project that came before you earlier uh, was like a direct involvement and recommendations from an inspection on the, the fire marshal half of that facility. So it really was like we, we had talked about a little bit was a timing situation of, of what was uh, pinpointed in that inspection and didn't really focus on those fire panels because they were you know, in good shape and operating at the time of the inspections. So it was just a, a timing situation of why that wasn't probably the big part of the, the other project that went in. 
and when we got our reports that identified our yearly reports, these were some of the panels uh, that needed to be taken care of was after the fact of what was brought before earlier. All set? Um, if you don't mind. I shouldn't even have raised my hand then because it's such a minor technicality. I just wanted to make the comment that <laughs> Joe had said that this is an approved CIP project. Um, it's a planned CIP project. I just want to be clear. It's not approved until you approve it. Oh. That was all. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for so I, I do appreciate that for the Thank record. Um, Mr. Murphy, were you going to say something? No, I'm fine. I mean, uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I think... Um, no further questions from the committee, we can prompt the vote. Five yeas, zero nays. Five yeas, zero nays, motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we go from drains to fire to elevators now, folks. So I'll look at a motion to open facilities maintenance and operations resolution elevator upgrades project. Mr. Spiz moved and Mr. Wiper supported. Oh. Okay, another fun and exciting uh, project. This project is for a replacement of a uh, dumbwaiter at the Novi District Court. Uh, <laughs> it's a 250 pound dumbwaiter, of approximately a four by four in size, uh, and three of the uh, drives at the courthouse, West Wing. Uh, those drives are basically the brains of those elevators, the control speed, torque, uh, operating schedules, and everything else. So we've had some issues with those drives. <laughs> and this is uh, uh, a way that we can uh, improve our reliability on those units. Um, that being said, I can open that up for any questions that you may have. Mr. Wiper. This is Ms. Spoke, Rochester. I've never seen an elevator at the Novi Court. It's a, it's a dumbwaiter. It, uh, it's used to all uh, their case files if they move up and down between the two floors. Uh, quite a, a few, a, a lot of documentation and boxes that move up and down those floors. Now, I, was, I, was, I was just commenting, you said no by. It's, it's Rochester. Rochester. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, I'm sorry. It's Rochester District Court. I was I apologize. having the same thought. That's right. a <laughs> one story building out there. Wondering what we yeah, kept in the basement. This is Rochester. This is Rochester. Mr. Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's, I'm not sure anybody here can answer this, but you've mentioned that it's for moving documents up and down. In today's age, why are we still moving documents up and down? Or aren't we using more technology and digitizing a lot of this information so we don't have to do that? So maybe a question. You, how many levels are in Rochester? Is there three? Mm -hmm. So they're moving stuff to the basement where they store right. documents is my guess? So maybe a side project we need to ask the courts to do is, can they digitize a lot of that information? Why do we have, why are we still storing documents in this day and age? That's a very good question. That we're I know take courts still use documents in some cases, but there's got to be a way that we can reduce that usage. So we don't need a dumb waiter. We're working with IT right now. Get a smart waiter. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, is it electric or is it is it a pulley? Like are they? No, it's a, a motorized unit. Okay, well, at least it's motorized. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ms. Markham, did you have a follow-up? Um, there is a discussion underway between IT and the courts to talk about digitizing their paper, and it, that's all the courts, the districts, the circuit, and the probate. That's a big bone of contention right now to get the money to do it and then get it done in a timely manner, so that's a great point. Yes. And digitized doesn't mean open for crime. It, it's going to be encrypted, and Correct. there'll be checks and balances. But uh, certainly, if something gets burned up in a fire, it's also not retrievable. So we've got to uh, cover our apple, as they say. So um, any further from the committee? If not, let's prompt the vote. We have a lot of records that were, you know, we're moving from under the jail to over here because they're in the basement and it's wet. Um, Motion carries with uh, uh, unanimously. Two months ago. And we are now at our final 
item under regular agenda, I'll take a motion to open Board of Commissioners resolution support for the filter first school water bills, Senate Bill 184 and 185. Mm -hmm. When was this It was, it was there when we approved the agenda. I know that, but oh. when I printed my packet out, it was last night. It was well, kind of a walk-on. Yeah. I thought I saw it last night. Well, um, does anyone want to move to walk this on? Well, they already approved the agenda. Yeah. Oh, yes. Duh. So then, uh, well, the, yes, it's been walked on, but don't I need a, res a motion of any sort? No. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Motion to open it. Yeah. Open to open oh. I'll take a motion to open item I under eight, Board of Commissioners resolution support for the filter first school water bills. Sure. Ms. Markham and Mr. Cavell in that order. Mr. Miller, are you available to talk about this one? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so does anyone have any comments or Questions about this? It, yeah, yeah. Can elaborate on that. Do you want me to talk about it? Yeah, yeah thank please. you, Connie. This one? Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this is a resolution that would support Senate Bills 184 and 185. And basically, these are known as the Filter First Program. And these would um, ensure clean drinking water for our schools and child care centers with the goal of uh, removing lead in the drinking water. As we know that lead exposure, uh, children are particularly vulnerable to that. And so these would put filtered water systems like one of our other projects have in the past, um, water systems in the schools that are filtered water drinking systems, and then filtered apparatus in childcare centers. And what the intent as well is that they would work then with um, preparing plans with the uh, NSF NASI standards and I'm looking for my acronym here. Uh, <clears throat> basically, they'd be working with EGLE. Um, as we know, they're the Department of Environmental Great Lakes and Energy, and that EGLE would be overseeing the plans. They would help provide a template to implement these plans into the programs, into the schools, and into the child care centers, and then they would be updated every five years. EGLE would then give them any direction on any changes to ensure that the filter systems are working in removing the lead for children. There's a lot of research on the effects of lead and how it can actually, uh, it's linked to damage of central and peripheral nervous systems, learning abilities, um, a multitude, and it's damage with the brain. In some cases, it's irreversible. So the intent is that uh, the board would uh, support these bills as well as, um, you know, just try to promote the importance of these into the child care centers and the schools within the state of Michigan. Thank you. That's a highlight. Appreciate it. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Connie, you may not know this. Was this introduced at a board of commissioners meeting? No, it not? will be. So the normal protocol is, is that the commission, because I'm assuming Commissioner Miller is sponsoring this. Yes, he is sponsoring. Normally it would be introduced at the Board of Commissioners meeting and then assigned to the committee and then come here. So this is kind of out of normal protocol. Yes, he wanted, yes he wanted to bring it here so that he could then get take it to the board. Is so there yes. a time concern with this being that it's in support of Senate bills? Is that the urgency? I can't urgency answer that question about okay. the sensitivity I know it's of time. It getting is. Getting close to lame duck and all those, so it could be a yes. time sensitive type yes. issue. And it's just building on what we as Oakland County have already done is, because we've sponsored multiple programs of putting these drinking fountains Correct. in all the Oakland County schools, if the schools agreed to participate. Do you know anything more detail about these bills? Is that similar to what we did? or are they looking to do something completely um, different? Legislature would have to put uh, funding in for these programs and make it available to the schools and to the child care centers. So they would put, and that Eagle would be responsible for the distribution of the funds. 
Okay. So my other question is, I'm just it's kind of why is it? I'm just wondering why is it Eagle? Normally, it would be mm -hmm. the health department has to do with yeah, the internal water, not Eagle. That's what threw me another curveball there, and yes. I don't know enough about these bills. I mean, in general, I like the idea, but I'd have to read up on the bill. So I'm kind of perplexed right now. I'm probably leaning towards voting no. So it's going to be on the regular agenda at the board unless we can agree to set it aside. I don't think Commissioner Miller wants to do that. Yeah, I remember uh, seeing Willie met a thing on Friday. Oh, yeah, we were at that thing. That was a <laughs> oh, it was a Democrat thing. I figured. But uh, uh, it was a great time. Everyone should be a Democrat because Democrats are awesome and have good times. <laughs> Anyways, that's not the point. William said he's putting this up because it is a time-sensitive thing, if I remember right. Thank you for so, that. Yeah. Yep. The funds, actually, just to continue on the funds, the appropriated funds will be utilized to establish the School and Child Care Center Clean Drinking Water Fund. So mm -hmm. just to establish that and commissioners uh, to provide additional information and support, I can send you a link to the um, state uh, analysis so you can read up on them the excerpts of it as well as see the financial and there has been cost estimates as you read the uh, resolution in the end which will actually produ uh, provide a cost savings in the long run over a 10-year plan a lot of research to show how the expenditures for example in the flint situation astronomical costs for cleanup providing water treatment of the children etc so I will send out the additional links on the uh, Senate analysis along with the financial analysis prior to the committee to each of you. And to what you just said too, Connie, um, it's important to note that Flint still does not, uh, certain parts of Flint still do not have clean drinking water. So that people, is correct. That people is still correct. have to use bottles of water for their water. I have a variety of research if anyone would like to have any additional information on that. Six years later. Thank you, Ken. So thank you for confirming that time sensitivity to it. Yeah. I had to rush it, but I didn't know if that was legit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Delivery, Were there Thanks. questions from the committee? Any further on this? Uh, I'll just mention that <clears throat> I'm a little unsure about my standing on this because uh, I know, for example, Southfield Public Schools, while I was on the board, which is just a handful, you know, just a blink of the eye ago, uh, we tested our our pipes and all that kind of stuff. I know uh, Oak Park has uh, rem remediated or mitigated pretty much all the lead in Oak Park altogether. So I'm, I'm just a little interested in, did we get any feedback from the school districts? Um, it also sounds like it still needs to be approved in Lansing, which we all know is never, nothing happens in Lansing. Um, sorry to those of you who love Lansing. Um, but I'm just curious if if we say yes, and where's the money coming from? It seems unfunded uh, at this point. So um, just wanted to lift that yeah. up into the sky. Could I, could I mention that? Please just, do. So this is based on, so the goal here of us doing this resolution is to say, please pass these bills that are up for debate soon. So right. it, I hear what you're saying about, like, maybe there's nothing happens in Lansing, but this is something that's likely to happen. And there's funding for it from the state level, so it wouldn't raise anyone's taxes. At, at, okay, 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 fair point. But there's there's a plan at the state to use state dollars, and that'd be a state-administered thing. So it wouldn't, I guess, provide onus on the county to do anything. And so then it, it, it wouldn't hurt, like, Oak Park or Southfield schools. And it wouldn't, you know, uh, so there you go. Mr. Smith? Yeah, if I may. And I don't necessarily want to get into debate about these bills because I haven't actually read them, but Lansing has a history of putting non- unfunded mandates against mm -hmm. communities and people within the state. You know, they may put this in to say you need to do this, but they're not going to provide any money for it. So I think we need to look at those bills in a little more detail first. And now if it's fully funded, it makes things a, a lot easier. But if it's not fully funded, it becomes a different discussion topic. Sure. Thank what? you, commissioners. And again, it's just support for the bills. Thank yeah. you. Um, let's prop the vote. Hmm? It's a ceremony of resignation. Yeah.
It's about he's got a really good point. The Ecology Center in uh, DC. I mean, you're gonna go to Jane O'Neill's house and say about it. No, I'm not. That's why I'm conflicted. That's exactly why I'm conflicted because I agree with him, but I have to. Womp womp. Silver tongue conservative. This this is my first time uh, where the motion fails. Did it fail? It failed two yays to three nays, and uh, we'll. We'll come back again okay. when the time is right. All right, that takes us to, <laughs> I lost my agenda, uh, public comment. That takes us to public comment, and I will just, bear with me, folks. Live TV. Okay. Oh, here we are. Uh, we'll move on into public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address the committee? Anyone from the public who would like to address the committee? Yeah, I got you. Sorry. As you say, we're sticking around for you. I was actually going to say, does Catherine want to address? I apologize. <laughs> no problem. And bring your mic nice and close. Okay. Catherine Kennedy Lake Orion. And I am very glad that you did not pass the GLEWA bill. I have a lot of questions about that organization. The first is which, why in the world would they approve Viking Cruises, a foreign corporation, to do leisure cruises through our Great Lakes to pollute our water? At the same time, we're spending millions. In fact, we authorized, I think it was $242 million to GLEWA just on June 30, 23rd at the full board when that was inserted in the meeting at the last minute. Huh? 242,000, somewhere Please in there. keep going, don't worry. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so there, I have a lot of questions about their accounting, including I've seen sewer bills that I don't understand how they're doing the math. It appears that they're charging 10% per month late fee, but I have to verify with another treasurer. Um, so I just have a lot of questions because some of what they're doing they're claiming to be protecting their waters, but they're not. If you're allowing Nestle to take so many galleons for what, a fee that's less than the amount that most residents pay for their water? I have a concern with that. I think the, the, too many of these organizations have gotten too big for their britches. I don't know how else to put it. They're too big and they're controlling too much, not in the best interest of the people. I think we need to be focusing local, local, local. That's the most green thing. We should not be importing oil from Russia because we want to make sure that we don't produce it ourselves. Even though America produced oil and gas industry in America was the cleanest producer of the, the fossil fuels. And if you have plastic, if you have clothes, if you have spandex, if you have so many polyester, all these materials are petroleum based. So if we don't create our own raw materials, guess who does? China. And you can go to WEFORUM, which is the World Economic Forum website, and go to their energy partner, and you will see China Energy is their partner. And they have transformational in their actual marketing ploy, that's the words they use, and they are building coal plants as we speak. So while the UN people want to say, oh yeah, America has to stop producing oil and gas, China is building coal plants to take over more of our manufacturing, because not a single manufacturing other than the electronic, like online type businesses can operate on electricity. None of them can. Elon Musk has told people that. He's what I believe a lot better than Mr. Biden or his crew. They don't understand the economy. They've done de total destruction in such a quick s amount of time, it's shocking. And uh, I don't know if you saw my comment yesterday about inflation, stagflation, but it used to be 1.4% inflation January 21st. We're at 8.3 now. That affects everybody, and the people with the least money are affected the most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kennedy. Anyone else from the public wish to speak before the committee? Seeing none, uh, public comment is officially closed. Uh, is there any further business to come before EDI today? If not, without objection, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.
going home and going to bed. <laughs> I think I failed. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 